we've read and studied this year, and it's been wonderful, hasn't it? Don't you feel like you're at that goal post? And we're about to hit a home run or whatever season it is for sports, I have no clue. But, uh, you know, I was raised in a denominational church, and at the age of about seven or eight, I gave my heart and life to the Lord. And uh, in our church, we were preached at rather than being taught the Word. And I'm so thankful for Calvary Chapel that we are taught the Word, and we're taught to be in the Word for ourselves as well. But in our little church, our pastor had two basic sermons. And he preached one every other week and the, other week the next week. And basically in different forms, the first one was, you must be born again. And then the second one was the Great Commission, go into all the world and make disciples. So I heard that preaching all of my life. So when I was seven or eight years old, sitting in this little church, I got up and I walked down the aisle and I gave my heart and life to the Lord. But at the end of every message that our pastor preached, he always gave an invitation for us to accept Christ or in case you had backslidden, was tacked on to the end, that come down to the front and rededicate your life to the Lord. I cannot tell you how many times I walked to the front to rededicate my flesh to the Lord, where my flesh really needed to die, but I didn't understand that. So I knew, even as a child, that I was a sinful person, and, you know, if I'd had a bad week, I'd walk down to the front, and if I had a good week, I'd walk down to the front, because the pastor would be usually standing down there by himself in the front, and I'd feel sorry for him, so I would down there. I had a very tender heart in those days. Uh -oh. But there were times when I knew that I'd really failed, and so there were times, because I had failed so terribly, I struggled with having the full assurance of my salvation. When I was doing good, I thought, yeah, I must be born again. And other times I thought when I was doing bad that maybe, just maybe, there was something that I hadn't said or my heart wasn't right or I didn't say the right words or have the right attitude. And mm -hmm. so with weeping and tears, I'd go through this over and over and over. And because of this, not having this full assurance and knowing that I was going up and down in my walk with the Lord, after struggling with this, there was just constant defeat for me in my life. There was discouragement. There was despair. And, and then even deep depression. I struggled for years and years with depression. So I know what it's like to go through that dark place, that dark cloud. And after struggling for, with this for almost 20 years in my walk with the Lord, 20 years, I experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And finally, this issue of my salvation was settled in my spirit once and for all. I knew from that point on that I was born again. I just went from, from having my fire insurance, you know, that my salvation, to, to having a love relationship with Jesus Christ. But if I had been taught through this first John, this chapter in First John chapter 5, I probably would have been assured of my salvation. <coughs> a lot sooner because John wrote this letter to the church for two main reasons and as you study you probably know this and he said first of all that we might have a certainty of who Christ is the Son of God God in the flesh and then second of all that we might know the certainty of our salvation having that full assurance of eternal life how many of you in this room have ever questioned whether you're really truly born again let's be honest Oh my goodness, so many of us. And the other group of us aren't telling the truth. So. <laughs> we need another lesson on that. <laughs> but the key verse for us is in chapter 5 and possibly the entire little book. And it's in verse 13. It says, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. So let's just look at this chapter. I'm going to read it through really quickly, and hopefully that will take up most of our time, and then we can say amen and go home. <laughs> Verse 1, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves him who begot also loves him who's begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. 
What a wonderful statement. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. That's another wonderful one to hold on to. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world? That he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not only by water, but by water and blood. And it's the Spirit who bears witness because the Spirit is true. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, who is the Word? Jesus. Jesus. And the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. So we have the Trinity right there in the verse. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree as one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he's testified of his Son. He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. And he who does not believe God has made him a liar, because he's not believed the testimony that God has given <coughs> the Son. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in the Son. He who has the Son has life, and he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. And now we have a very difficult portion of Scripture to read. Now this is the confidence that we have in Him. If we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions we've asked of Him. If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask. And he will give him life for those who commit sin, not leading to death. And there is a sin leading to death. I don't say that he should pray about that. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not leading to death. We know that whoever is born of God does not sin, but who, he who has been born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true. In his Son, Jesus Christ, this is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Now we gave to you that key verse. But throughout this book, John's been concerned with what we know for certain. There's a lot in this chapter that we don't know, but there are a lot of things that we do know. He began the letter in 1 John chapter 1 with the certainty of his firsthand eyewitness testimony of Jesus Christ. And he uses the word no 39 times throughout this little letter because he wants us to know that we know that we know. Last week, Brenda reminded us again that what we believe determines how we behave. So we need to know that we know and know what we know in order to be mature, to be fruitful, and to be victorious believers. This is a, a knowing faith that grows from a saving faith. And without this knowing, this assurance of who Christ is, and the full assurance of this life, we can't enjoy it or live it to the fullest. When I was on this yo-yo, up and down, and walk with the Lord, maybe I am and maybe I'm not, I was totally unfruitful. There was no fruit coming from my life that was really ripe and juicy and attractive to anyone who would look at it. In fact, I wanted to fulfill the Great Commission when I was doing good. But I looked at my life and I thought, there's really no love and no joy and no peace and no gentleness and kindness and meekness and no self-control. I was a screamer in my neighborhood. I screamed at my kids. I was probably known on the block as the screamer. And so I looked at my life and I thought, how could I tell anybody about, about Jesus and say, come and be like me? You're going to be depressed. You're going to be discouraged. You're going to be out of control. You know, you're not going to have any love. And all these things are going to go through. So I was not living life to the fullest. So if we want to be attracted to the world, we need to know that we've been born again and have that assurance of salvation and that hope that we're going to be with him in heaven. Because if we're not assured of that, we don't have that hope, do we? How many times did I go to a funeral or a memorial service and sit there wondering, What's going to happen to me if I'm not born again? And if I'm not born again, what did I not do right that I can be born again? So how can we be sure? 
that we have salvation and eternal life. John gives us another test. He's given us many tests, litmus, litmus tests throughout this whole book. And now he gives us another one in the verses 1 to 4. And he gives us four characteristics of those, or marks of those who've been truly born again. First of all, is that belief that Jesus is the Christ. Notice he says that Jesus is the Christ. What does that mean? Sometimes we overlook those phrases. Jesus is his name, but Christ is his title. That means is that he is the, the anointed one. Mm -hmm. He was anointed by God to do this ministry, to come and give himself for our salvation. He's the Messiah, the one that had been foretold back in the book of Genesis when God had spoken to Adam and Eve and told them that they would have a seed and his seed would one day crush the head of Satan, the serpent, and his seed, the serpent seed, would bruise the heel of Christ. So he's the Messiah, the one that the Jews had looked for so long. No wonder all Jewish women hoped that they would have a boy because they thought that he would be the and they would be the special one who would give birth to that child. And then it means he's the son of God. That's what Christ means. We should look at his name sometime and make a full study of that. It's amazing. So first of all, belief that Jesus is the Christ. Second of all, we're to have love for those who have experienced this new birth, the body of Christ. Notice in this passage, he doesn't say that we're to love the world, but he says we're to love one another. If we can't love one another in the body of Christ, how are we going to love people in the world? It's not easy. Sometimes I find it's easier, though, to love those in the world than I do in the body of Christ, because in the body of Christ, we don't expect them to sin. And we become discouraged and disheartened when we see them act like everybody else. But you know what? It's not up to us to <coughs> It's up to the Lord. So would you have love for those in the body of Christ? And then the third characteristic is obedience to God's commands. And he says that these are not burdensome. Why are they not burdensome for us now, his commandments to us? Because now they're motivated by love. Now we recognize how much he loves us, and our response now is not out of works of, of trying to please him because I'm afraid of him, but now I see how much he loves me, how much he's done for me, how much he's still doing and he will do, and my response is out of love. Let me tell you that I was 16 years old when I got married. I was waiting for that wow. <laughs> difficult years for me yeah. because I was young and because I had babies right away mm -hmm. and because I really didn't know well this man that I married mm -hmm. who does until they <laughs> <laughs> I still don't know I mean, the gatelings are still changing <coughs> after all of these years <coughs> and I would do things that were pleasing to him because I was afraid that he'd become angry with me if I didn't do them. He liked his shirts to be ironed. Can you imagine in this day and age? <laughs> and ladies, let me tell you, he still likes his shirts ironed. I've tried to put them in the dryer and pull them out and put them on the hanger right away and put them in his closet like he wouldn't know it. And he'll pull them out and put them on and say, you didn't iron my shirt. And I've asked him many times, how do you that. And he said, when I look down, I can see the nap of the fabric standing up. But I did that for him because I was afraid he'd become angry. I fixed his meals the way he wanted them fixed on time. That was before we had microwaves, so I had to keep them warm if he was late from work. I did all those things because I wanted to please him out of fear. But you know, the longer I lived with this man, the more I realized how much he loved me. <coughs> I mean, he takes the dishes out of the dishwasher. He will vacuum for me. He always puts gas in my car. He makes sure that the car is maintained for me. He does all these wonderful things, and now my response is motivated out of pleasing him because I love him. 
and see how much he loves me. So it's a mutual admiration society. And I don't know where I was going to go in this. <laughs> but obedience to his commands. And our relationship with the Lord should be the same way. Now we respond to him. Now, not because somebody else is telling us that you need to do these things. Or you need to be this kind of a woman. Or you need to be this kind of a mother. Or you need to... To do, to do, to do. <coughs> That's not our motivation anymore. Our motivation now is a response out of love. Amen. I want to give to the Lord. I want to give my tithe. I want to serve in church. I want to serve in the women's ministry. I want to pray. I want to be in his word. Why? Because I want to please him. That should Amen. be our goal. How can I please the Lord's heart today? When I get up. My <coughs> pastor's wife, formerly is Kay Smith. And I grew up under her mentoring and her teaching, and she has a whole series on pleasing God. And as Christian women, we should make it our goal in whatever place in life we find ourselves to be pleasing God. Not just pleasing to him. You see, we are already pleasing to him. That's our position. But now our actions should be, because of this, we want to be pleasing him in whatever way we can find. The fourth characteristic or mark gives us is victory over the world system. Victory. We're overcomers now because of our faith in Christ. We're now seated in the heavenlies with Jesus Christ who is victorious over the enemy. He defeated the enemy at the cross at the resurrection. And one day he's going to completely defeat him and put him into the pit. So now we can get him. But because we are in Christ, and he is in us, if he is seated in the heavenlies, where does that place us? In the heavenlies. Where? In the heavenlies. We are seated with him in the heavenlies. So all those things that are going down here, the conflicts that we're experiencing, have already been taken care of as far as Christ is concerned. We're more, more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ who loves us, who keeps us. If I were to take my terrible Kleenex that I keep with me all the time, and this Bible represents Jesus Christ, if we are in him, and I place that inside my Bible, where does that put me? In him. Surrounded by him, covered by him, protected by him, and he is seated in the heavenlies. That means I'm right there with him. Hallelujah. Amen. If we have no other reason to respond, to please him, it's because he gives us that. The word translated overcomer means to be a victor. And the noun form in the Greek is Nike. <laughs> Did you know that? Or Nike. Remember, our, our own country nation had Nike <coughs> missiles. And it means to have victory, to have superiority, to defeat. And because Christ triumphed one day, we also are triumphing over the world system. It's the world system that tries to mold us into its image. But we have victory now because we can call on the Lord. Now we have these very difficult passages in verses 6 to 8. Let me say right off the bat, that even the most learned scholars don't agree. Martin Lloyd-Jones, one of the scholars that I look at and learn from, says, there can be no question at all but that these three verses are not only the most difficult verses in this epistle, but I think they're the most difficult verses in a sense in the entire Bible. And there have been four main interpretations, and I don't want to make this really long, so when my time is up, somebody give me a signal, okay, so I can wrap it up because I can go long. <laughs> Four main interpretations. Some believe that the water and the blood are symbolic references to the sacraments of baptism and communion. Some believe that this testifies to the blood and the water that flowed from the spear wound at his crucifixion because water and blood comes forth and came forth. Some believe it refers to the Old Testament rites of purification and blood sacrifice. 
Some believe this refers to Jesus' baptism at the beginning of his earthly ministry and blood as a reference to his death on the cross. Now, because the scholars don't agree on that, you're going to have to look at that carefully and just say, this is something that I don't understand, but this seems to be the closest interpretation, and you choose which one you want to follow. But John points out that the Spirit testifies that the Holy Spirit bore witness at Christ's baptism he bore witness at Christ's anointing. Remember when he came into the temple and he picked up the book of Isaiah and he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me to anoint me. And then he told of all the things he was going to do, set the prisoner free and set the captives at liberty. So the Holy Spirit was there. The Holy Spirit bore witness of Christ's sacrifice for our sins. And John was basically saying these three witnesses, the spirit, the blood, and the water are trustworthy as eyewitnesses. In a court of law, the truth of a matter is established by trustworthy witnesses who agree in their testimony. And so John's argument is that if we regard or receive the testimony of men who can be untrustworthy at times, how much greater is the testimony that God has given through his Holy Spirit? And he testifies of all these things that Jesus really is the Son of God. And if we believe this testimony, then we have eternal life. And disbelief in that fact is saying that God is a liar. That God is a liar. And none of us would want to do that. <clears throat> say that God is a liar because we didn't want to be a pile of ashes on the ground. <laughs> and those who believe that fact now have the Holy Spirit within them testifying that we belong to him. The Holy Spirit within us. And this is why believers can say with certainty that they know that they're going to go to heaven when they die. Hallelujah. Our faith is not a hope so, but a no so. Amen. Now, those are the things, some of the things we don't understand and that we don't know. But what about the things that we can know? John gives us five things here. First of all, we can know we have eternal life. Second of all, we can know that he hears our petitions and he will answer. When I cry out to God, I can know with certainty that because I'm his child, he's listening to me and he's going to answer. He might not always give the answer that I want, but he will answer. He might not give it in the timing that I want, but he will answer in his time. And God always hears us when we cry out to him. Third thing that we can know that whoever is born of God does not sin. You see, we have a new birth. We went from death to life. We went from the seed of Adam now into the seed of Christ. And because we belong to Christ in him, positionally, we don't sin anymore. Because that's how the Father sees us, is in the Son. The fourth thing we can know for sure is that we are of God and the world is of the wicked one. Anybody who's been a believer and been in this world or just got up this morning knows that we're in a wicked world. It's all around us. I was listening to the radio on the way here and I thought, I can't listen to this anymore. I don't want to know what's going on in the world for today. Yeah. Wait till I get through. Because it's a wicked world that we live in. Men are calling good evil and yes. evil good. And it's going to get worse and worse, girls. We should be aware of this. The scriptures tell us that in the end times, it's going to get worse and worse and worse. So we should not be alarmed, and neither should we be surprised. Why do we get up and say, I can't believe they did that? <laughs> because that's what the scripture says. There are unbelievers, they're going to act like unbelievers. <coughs> But the glory of it is that it's an indication that everything is winding up for that Amen. final, Amen. final day when he will return. The world is of the wicked one. Now, the fifth thing that we can know for certain is that the Son of God has come and given us an understanding of God the Father. Jesus came to show us the Father. In him we see God the Creator. Now, let's look at what we don't know. Verses 16 to 17 are very difficult. 
Does anyone have a good interpretation of that? Because if you do, you come up here and you give it. Because I don't know. And I looked at this passage when they assigned it to me, and I thought, oh my goodness, that's not fair at all. <laughs> They're just as difficult, or maybe more so, than the ones that we just went into. What is the sin leading unto death? And some of the scholars kind of skim over it and talk about the non-believer who doesn't accept Christ, and that's the only sin that can be un can not be forgiven. But he <clears throat> talks about uh, the brother <laughs> who who sins a sin unto death. So this means he's a believer. And um, so it it's interesting. I don't know what that is. And none of the scholars do really either. And in verse 14, then we're asked about this, that we are to ask in prayer according to his will. But we're not to pray for the one, the sin that's leading to death. I just know that I don't want to be in that position, and as much as possible, I'm not going to sin. <laughs> so don't, don't be in that place. Although, I have to say, going back, and this is just my opinion, it could refer to what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where he talks about communion. And he says that many in the body of Christ come to the communion table and take communion, not discerning what the Lord's body is, and because of this they sleep. So it could be either taking communion in an unworthy matter, or it's also talking about physical healing at that, that point either. Maybe they don't recognize that at that point of communion that they can ask God to physically touch their bodies. And because of that, they've neglected it, and then they've died because of it. Now, some other people believe that way, and I, I tend to kind of maybe think that that could be an answer. I don't know. I just don't know. We don't have these things. But in verse 14, we're told and directed to ask according to God's will. Now, that brings up another question. How can I know that I'm praying according to God's will? I think if our relationship is right and we're walking with the Lord, that when we come to the place of prayer, into his throne room, that his Holy Spirit begins to guide us in the things that we pray for. And when his Holy Spirit is the one who's guiding us, then we can know that we're praying according to God's will. And I want to throw in another little aspect here as well. We are told in Romans chapter 8, verses 26 and 27, that the Holy Spirit himself makes intercession for us with moanings and groanings that can't be uttered. And I do believe that that's also referring to the gift of tongues, and that could be debated, but also in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, he talks about this gift that we and the body of Christ have labeled the prayer language. There are some times I just do not know how to pray. I don't know if it's God's will to heal my friend. I don't know if it's God, God's will for her to get this guy <laughs> or to marry that guy. I don't know what God's will is in many instances. Do you know God's will? I'm baffled. The older that I get, the more I realize I don't know anything. <laughs> How can I know what God's will is for me? I don't know. Does God want me to buy this car or not buy this car? Does God want me to do this or not to do this? What, what is the answer? Sometimes he gives it clearly in his word, most of the time, if we're, we're in the word on a regular basis. But there's some things that are not black or white. They're just not there for us. They're gray. So how do I know I'm praying according to God's will? I think the gift of tongues is a wonderful gift, a wonderful tool for intercession, because we can know that we're praying according to God's will. When I got filled with God's Spirit or baptized with His Spirit, it was a year later before I actually sought that particular gift. And the reason I sought it was because I didn't know how to pray God's will. And so I can know that when my understanding runs out, then I can pray with this particular gift. So if you don't have that gift, seek it. The, the scripture tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 to pursue love and seek or follow after the gifts of the Spirit. So this is the prayer God answers if we pray according to God's will. And this is the point is he's making He's giving an illustration to us of something that's not according to God's will, and that's the sin that's unto death. Only God knows what that sin is, and we can only speculate, but we need to remember the point. God hears us, 
God answers and God gives that answer. So he tied the assurance of our salvation with prayer, knowing that because we're born again, our entire life will be confidence in him, approaching him in prayer. My prayer life is not what I would like it to be. I don't think it will ever be what it needs to be. But hopefully I'm growing in that particular area. And biblical prayer is simply submitting my will mm -hmm. to God's will. Amen. He already knows the answer. But by coming to him in prayer and asking him, I'm submitting myself to him. It's not my will anymore, but thy will be done. Now, in 1921, Thomas Edison said, we don't know the millionth part of 1% about anything. We don't know what water is. We don't know what light is. We don't know what gravity is. We don't know what heat is. We don't know what electricity is. We have a lot of hypotheses about these things, but that's all. But we don't let our ignorance about us, about them, deprive us of their use. And in the same way, there are a lot of things that we don't know or understand about prayer or about God's word, but this we can't know. God cares, God hears, and God answers. And so John closes this little book with a final warning. Isn't it interesting that he would tack this on at the end? He says, little children, little ones, keep yourselves from idols. This means... When we talk about keeping ourselves from this, it means literally to guard ourselves. This implies that we have something that's very valuable that the enemy is trying to steal. Spurgeon says that if a man has a box and he's not sure what's in it, he won't be careful about guarding it. But if he knows he has a rare and valuable treasure, he'll be diligent to guard it carefully. John is saying that if we know the true God and his son, Jesus Christ, we have a treasure. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are to guard him carefully. We are to make him our priority, and we're not to drift into idolatry of any kind. And that idolatry is to anything that we put in front of our relationship with Jesus Christ. It can be very good things, but not the best things. Mm -hmm. Little girls, little women, little Christian sisters, keep yourselves from idols this summer. It's so easy. Once we're not in fellowship like this, once we're not held in accountability like this, to let ourselves slide into those things that are of the world. Be careful. Guard yourself. Praise your name. Thank you that you helped us make it through this portion of scripture, Lord, that's so hard to understand. And Lord, I think when we get to heaven, we're going to have a lot of questions, but when we see you, it won't even matter. It won't matter at all just to see you. But until that time, Lord, let us be women who live to please you. Let us be women who love others the way you love us. Let us guard ourselves from the things of this world. Lord, I know that that would please your heart. <clears throat> Be with each one of these women, Lord, the ones who are struggling in their walk with you, the ones who are even victorious, Lord, it's almost in a more precarious place to be doing well because then we tend to become complacent. So help us never to be complacent, Lord. Never to take anything grand for granted that we're strong and we can handle it. Lord, we're only overcomers through you. We're only victorious through you. Keep us, we pray, Lord, close to your side, close to your heart, listening to your